This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. And I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week on the show, we actually are pre-recorded our interview this week to accommodate uh, our guest schedule, but we got to have a really interesting conversation with composer, vocalist, uh, and and all-around very interesting person, Kate Soper. We talked to her about her background as a singer-songwriter, about the current uh, project she's working on now with some really interesting techniques between voices and instruments. Um, and some projects she has coming up for the future around kind of uh, operas, for lack of a better term, uh, that she has coming up. And it was a really great conversation. Check it out. All right. We are here with Kate Soper, composer, performer, and writer. Kate, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I think I'd like to start out uh, by asking you about this recent performance that happened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, your piece, I Was Here, I Was I, was performed. Um, it got a pretty good review in the New York Times. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, the inception of this piece and uh, how the performance went on Friday the 20th? Sure. Um, well, this piece was a collaboration with uh, Alarmal Sound, the ensemble directed by Alan Pearson and Nigel Maester, who was the librettist and director, who was a longtime collaborator and co-founder, I think, of the group. So it had a bit of a circuitous conception. Um, Alarmal Sound was in residence at the Met Museum for the last year. And um, they had a series of concerts to do that they were programming uh, when Alan, the conductor, and I were trying to find a way to work together. We'd worked together a few years ago on a piece I wrote um, for a Carnegie Hall training workshop. So... I think Alan came to a show I was in at La Mama Theater a few years ago, two or three years ago, that I didn't write. I was just performing in and kind of was like, oh, I didn't know you were doing this theatrical thing. And mm. I said, yeah, that's my bag now. And he said, we should do something. And um, I said, we should. So then uh, when they were looking to program the Met thing, uh, they uh, decided together with the Met program director that they would do some kind of installation sort of theatrical opera piece. Um, and then there was a lot of uh, back and forth about which spaces were going to be acceptable for us to use. And uh, it ended up being the Temple of Dendor. So it why was... Not? Uh, why not? I mean, you know, that's one of the more logical choices because they already do a lot of kind of banquetizing and concertizing in there. And it's a beautiful space and audience can sit down. So, you know, we had a lot of ideas before about, well, they'll wander through this gallery and then we'll do something here and something there. But, um, you know, there's a lot of fragile priceless artwork in there. So I think, uh, having a big space where people could sit down. And then of course it's an incredible, uh, just presence in the museum, this actual temple that's in this huge, and the room itself is just so stunning with these windows. So Nigel set to work writing the libretto, which was his creation entirely. And he was working with a text of, a uh, British explorer who had traveled a lot in Egypt in the 19th century, who became my character. And then he created a kind of present day every man who also harkened back to someone that was in the British woman's memoirs and then wove it into some stories about the temple itself. And it's, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, so it was uh, built by a uh, 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 Egyptian man who had lost two of his sons and it was sort of in their memory. And then there was some uh, sort of 20th century political stuff about um, the dam at Aswam that was built. And yeah, just a lot of sort of strains of uh, Egyptian life and culture and Dendor specific things kind of woven together. So this piece actually exists in several different time periods. It exists in several different time periods. And uh, so then I, uh, in setting the music, I was sort of trying to find ways to weave them all together. So um, I, the things that I tend to do in my work in general, I, I, I tend to use a lot of speech and singing and sort of try to use a lot of different kind of vocal sounds. And I like to um, incorporate instruments into vocal writing and uh, come up with kind of, um, I don't know, uh, hybrid vocalizing or something. So just that they're, um, 
are so many kind of colorful possibilities of instruments that can kind of be um, suggested to what the voice is doing. So I gave every character a, uh, an avatar, as we ended up calling them. Uh, and I had a flute, which also is a dear friend and a wonderful colleague, Aaron Lesser, um, flutist. And uh, another character had a trombone and someone else had a viola. And yeah, the show was actually really beautiful. We were it was very hectic putting it together. The Met was very generous in giving us a lot of time in there, but they couldn't close the museum. So we were rehearsing just kind of like people out of the way. And, uh, <laughs> and Nigel was really trying to use the space as much as he could. And I think he came up with some really beautiful solutions. Um, but, it, you know, it's sort of hard to concentrate when you're kind of like 30 feet away from the conductor and, you know, some tourist is sort of like taking an iPhone video of you and you're kind of trying to, as the composer, also listen to what's going on over there and make notes and memorize. So a lot of moving parts, but at the end of the day, it was really beautiful and just really special to be in the presence of this um, incredible artwork or building or just monument and um, kind of communicate it with it in this way. Mm -hmm. And to be fair to the tourists at the Met, I probably would have taken a video of that as well. Sure. I mean, you know, it's 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 fine. You're helping promote the performance, Dave. Yeah. Right. I mean, they got to see the piece for free, so that was cool. Too, <laughs> sure. But, uh, yeah. Sure. That's really cool. Uh, it's, that reminds me, actually, of the, so the, the, the kind of interaction between the voice and the instrument that you're talking about there of the first piece of yours that I uh, – became familiar with was uh, a video that kind of went mildly viral around our little music new music viral sphere. went I new music six, viral it's like being new days. music famous right right yeah. right um uh it was um oh gosh i'm blanking on the the title now um it, uh, the it, word it was uh only the words themselves mean what they say and um, it was it's 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 you and uh, I believe it's the same. Flute it is the player, very same, right? Yes. Um, so uh, and, and and the the line between the vocalist and the flutist is very blurry. A lot mm -hmm. of the things the voice is doing is kind of instrumental filigree, and a lot of the things the flute is doing are very speech like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm curious if you could maybe talk about the the relationship that that you that you think about between a person's voice and an instrument um yeah well that's something that i think about a lot now and that was the first piece i'd written um let's see it was it was definitely the hardest thing i'd ever written for myself as a vocalist and it was the first one i'd written that has this kind of intense duo virtuosity and now i've kind of embarked on a series i have one for violin voice and percussion and voice and i'm writing a series of quartets for voice percussion violin and flute to link them together and a lot of my work now is kind of involved in this this way of melding voices and instruments and i think for me it, it serves a lot of both practical and conceptual um goals so Practically, it helps me find new things to do as a performer because if my motivation is that I'm trying to stand up to my brilliant instrumental colleagues and also kind of um, take on some of their rich sound world, um, that kind of unlocks a lot of possibilities for it. it, makes me try things out with my voice that I might not otherwise. And then I think because I didn't, I never got a degree in vocal music and I never did a you know recital or anything like that, I, I have a sort of interesting relationship with the whole kind of like soprano thing. And, um, I, I don't, it, it's interesting to me how, um, much the singer is always the focus and always, uh, has to be the one who has the meaning and the words and is telling you what to do and is being supported. And, um, I'm not always comfortable in that role. I'm interested in exploring other roles. So uh, it's also a way to kind of challenge that a little bit and um, look for literal meaning or, um, I don't know, kind of uh, prominence in the instrumentalist who's standing next to the singer or something. So those are a lot of ideas I've been thinking about. And then I just, as a composer, it's really, uh, you learn so much working closely with the with the instrumentalists, with the musicians who are making your music. And I find as a performer, you learn even more. Um, so it's just been good to uh, have a bunch of really close 
excellent colleagues that I can kind of put a piece together with and, you know, have them workshop it with me as both performer and composer. Well, I think of the piece that Dave is referring to, um, you know, it, it, it really doesn't feel like you need to be or are being supported by the flu. Um, like your delivery really demands attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like, I mean, you're looking right at the camera and it's like, listen to me. Mm-hmm. This should, is what I'm saying. Check out a, a little clip from that. Yeah, play a little cool. clip. Yeah, just it's just a little about a minute or so off uh, from the from the beginning of this this piece. This is uh, only the words themselves mean what they say by our guest Kate Sober. So that was just a little excerpt from Only the Words Themselves Mean What They Say by, by our guest, uh, Kate Soper. That was Aaron Lesser playing flute and text by Lydia Davis. Thank you for, for sharing that with us and letting us play it. Uh, it's really cool. This, that performance was expressly for the video, right? That wasn't uh, 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 something you were doing for like a regular concert and you kind of uh, adapted it into this thing, right? This was a video. No, no, that was a, a, we, I was up with my ensemble, Wet Ink. We were doing a recording at MPAC, uh, and that piece was going to be on uh, our recording. This is Relay, which is our second album. And um, I just, it's the kind of piece that doesn't, you can't really get the whole thing without a video. So I uh, asked if we could, um, if we could shoot it too. So we had a really fun morning of, um, yeah, making that video. But we performed it live many, many times, too. And I think I have a video of the premiere online um, also somewhere. It's really great um, that you're getting that kind of documentation. What were you going to say, Sam? Well, to me, the kind of music that you, or the kind of pieces that you say you're into these days, like that's your bag, the theater thing, almost demands documentation in video. Mm. Um, and from a compositional what is that, Dave? Uh, we're getting a little feedback. That happens sometimes after a uh, uh, after playing some music. So, Kate, can oh, okay. you grab your headphones? Oh, I can't even hear it really. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's coming from you, so oh. uh, that's, why we we're, that's why we're getting it. Oh, do you want me to put headphones on? Yeah, could you please? Thanks. I don't think I have earbuds, so. That's all right. The people who really Seri- care. This is for, yeah, this is a serious music show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> don't undersell it, Dave. You can use headphones as long as they're really expensive headphones. Right. It's very important. They must cost at least $200. <laughs> so, sorry, Sam, what, what, what is it that you were, uh, you were I, saying? Are you connected, Kate? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I was saying, from a compositional point of view, it's interesting. You were talking about how um, you don't want the voice. I guess maybe I would say when you and a flute player walk out there as an example, there's a whole lot of expectations the audience has typically, and they're going to look at you because you're not holding anything. So you're the singer. So you're going to be the thing that, you know, the focus that we're going to deal with. Right. And, and using understanding that that's there and using it as a tool, as you're working the piece to confound those expectations to me is a very effective 
in this piece, and not the least of which because the flute sort of has a special, I'd say, relationship with voice because it's a woodwind instrument. Right. You're generating the sound yeah, with, yeah. Your, with your diaphragm and everything else, but you don't have anything in your mouth. Right, so she can talk and do all these other yeah. things. Although I was thinking watching that, that it's, it's um, you know, me saying like, well, I don't want to be center of attention, and then this piece where I'm just like demanding so. that people <laughs> stare at me. But I think there is something about... Um, just having someone beside me who really is following, like really tracking me and um, that there are a lot of moments in which she is the prominent timbre, even if you can't tell, uh, and um, that she is fully participating in what I'm doing as a singer. And it's not like, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's really chamber music in the, in the truest sense. And the thing that like we all get excited about going to see chamber music for that kind of – egalitarian collaboration between members of, of like a string quartet, which, mm -hmm. is, which is something you don't often get as Sam was saying with vocal music. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and I really, I really enjoy, um, cause like you said, you're the only thing I think that really makes sure everybody stays focused on you as the subject is that you're the only person who can use words that have, you know, connotative and denotative meaning. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's going to draw someone's attention. But right. Just from a pure sound point of view, it seems very equal. Yeah, and I'm trying to kind of push that more. Like uh, I have a violin and, and voice piece that I wrote the, the next year, I think, with another member of Wet Ink, Josh Modney. And uh, he can't um, talk into the flute or he doesn't use air, but he can actually just talk because uh -huh. he's got his, you know, his apparatus free. So there is a movement where we're both talking and um, there is uh, the first third of the piece or so I'm only ever singing on one pitch and he has all the kind of melodic stuff. And, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm still trying to find ways to, um, kind of like ch change that hierarchy a little bit, uh, even further. Yes. Yeah. Well, I look forward to, uh, more endeavors in that vein. Well, and so I uh, just uh, expanding on this in, in this piece, we just watched an excerpt of you are kind of creating this 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 two-headed performer uh mm -hmm. out of you and the and the and the and, and the flute right. and in in this new piece that that we started talking about uh i was here i was i you are doing that in pairs uh and so i'm, I'm curious about how how then those uh units interact with one another um well that's an interesting question actually in the opera uh the thing that i just did on friday um, there wasn't a ton of interaction between, within the pairs, um, because they tended to be when, when it was time for me to sing, it was in my time world and I wasn't interacting with the Egyptian engineer from 1960 or something. So he and his viola were off doing something else. Um, there was a little bit more with me and the guy who had the trombone pair, uh, Matt Marks and Michael Cleville. Um, but I think the, the process for um, the characters was similar. I had the flute and we had some similar moments to the duo. Um, but yeah, I think in this instance, um, yeah, I, I didn't really find a way to kind of like meld um, the pairs. That's interesting now. I'm the New York Times that. review, Zachary Wolf says that he, he calls it, what is it? Uh, uh, Peter and the Wolf-like. So oh yeah, there's not as much like complete jamming together and more like, you know. Well, the difference I guess there is that Peter and the Wolf doesn't have the presence of a of an actual like singer to go along with mm -hmm. the. Um, I mean that was a you know it, it's totally logical uh, comparison, um, but yeah I mean uh, unlike the the pieces that I have for me and single instrument in this case. I was able to, um, once you had really strongly associated each of the characters, which one of the instruments, you could start to use the instrument and um, recall the character to the audience, even if they weren't singing, which is, of course, a very typical and kind of classical, a more classical technique. Right. Just because it's been done lots and lots, you shouldn't throw it out. Oh, no. I'm, um, I'm doing I was wondering, if, so I love, like we had uh, Ken Ueno on the show the other couple of weeks back and he just recently did a piece that was like he called it an installation slash opera uh -huh. this is similar i mean you didn't obviously build any of the installation but you wrote it centered upon an existing structure 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you have, like, do you think this piece can only work in that space, or would you welcome the idea of staging it in a different space? Um, I don't know. I think it would be, I think the best place to do it is in that space, and that's some part of why it was so special and maybe the most special thing about it. Um, not only just the uh, the physical structure, but the, um, the, uh, the acoustics of this, huge room was just that was something that was really fun for me as a composer and something that I I didn't really have a good feel for until we got into there into the space but you know you can do anything in there you just like play a violin harmonic trill and it's just like oh that's so beautiful and it's so fun to sing in there like everybody just sounds amazing um because it's just like endless reverb um and it was just yeah it was just very special there were some very beautiful staging moments and you know, I had a moment where I am not in a couple of the very last things, but I was on stage. So I was just sort of sitting down in character, but just kind of looking out at the windows and just feeling like, this is amazing. This is the way to experience this temple, like sit here, you know, with my safari hat on and just kind of take it all in and hear music from every side. So of course it's possible to do it in other places and I'm sure we will, um, uh, you know, figure that out, but uh, it'll be hard to top the actual Temple of Dender. Right. I think you'd have maybe some pictures and some text in the program notes or whatever. Yeah, sure. Um, Video. I mean, you know, I'm sure other people have better ideas. Yeah, these days you could expect most people in the audience to be able to pull up a quick YouTube video even. Yeah, yeah. And prime their brain for the piece with video first. Sure. Um, Sort of dovetailing on the idea of it being place specific is it being Kate specific. (laughs) <laughs> so, like, you're writing this vocal music, um, and the intent being to, I mean, you're singing the part, right? Um, mm-hmm. Have, I want to know, do you visualize or do you uh, think other singers could easily do these, or is it so specific to your voice that that would be difficult? And do you go out of your way to notate your part, but I'm pretty sure you know how your part's going to go. Do you mm-hmm. meticulously notate your part such that someone who doesn't know it could mimic it? Uh-huh. Well, that's something that, um, it depends on the piece. So something like the, I was here, I was, I could easily be done by any number of singers and performers. And, um, there's nothing in there that would challenge a, a, a performer uh, or that would, that would, uh, prevent a new music singer from, from taking it on. And I think that's true of other pieces, but it's a little trickier. Um, the flute and voice piece actually has been performed many times by, um, various uh, singers and it's been really wonderful to see that Um, it's always very very different and I think that's inevitable and um, uh, it's so much of it involves just kind of like the way I am like the way I'm talking now to you guys or just the way that I kind of um, sing to myself when I compose or something that it just isn't isn't quite possible somehow to recreate that because it's not just about the um, singing voice, but about kind of character and personality. So of course people who are different and have different personalities are going to, um, it's going to sound really different. And I totally embrace that and accept it. I think, you know, um, it's, it's not a drawback. It's just a reality of writing music. That's very specific. I do try to be as specific as I can with the notation, but it's difficult because some of the sounds that are even sounds that are very easy to produce or that anyone could produce, even not a singer, are impossible to notate. Um, but I think that's why I, I'm starting to feel now, especially as a singer, that and as I work with other singers, um, that it's so easy to just say, well, just do what I'm doing and then do it and have someone do it back to you, that that we're kind of in this sort of returning to like our old tradition age. Well, just that like the videos are helpful. Like right. you don't have to do it like this, but this is what like this is the timing. It's sort of like like showing the clip that you just saw is easier than like writing a bunch of squiggly lines and saying like circa four seconds, you know, and just like trying to like, what dynamic is that? So, um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a piece that, um, will speak to hopefully and hopefully other pieces too, uh, that I've, that I've written in this vein that are more complicated. Hopefully they'll speak to some singers who have similar concerns that I do or want to be challenged in similar ways. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I want to throw them out there. I'm, I'm not trying to keep anybody away. Well, you actually brought up the next topic I wanted to dovetail into, which yeah. is the idea of, like, if you're doing something that's so sort of enigmatic to try to write down, uh-huh. and to have a video as part of the score, you know, mm-hmm. like, 
it goes like this. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have an experience exactly like yours because I'm not, a, well, I'm not a good singer, but I wrote a saxophone piece that has mm-hmm. lots of very strange and very specific notation and it's based on me being a saxophone player and really uh-huh. knowing how it goes right. and then working with a specific saxophone player and really grilling over everything and then hear it where I didn't have anything to do with the performer and you mm-hmm. hear this performance and they're like, oh my God, what is that? Yeah. Right, right. Like, how did this person come up with such a different set of sounds mm-hmm. out of that list of instructions? But it yeah. was good. It was yeah. good. Well, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we have to accept that as composers and never let it limit us in what we're doing and in our, you know, use the tools that are available to us, even if they're not, um, you know, widely available. Um, I, I am in an ensemble, Wet Ink, and I've been working with them for a long time. And um, another recent piece, I had a CD come out this year, Voices from the Killing Jar. And that was really about me having spent many years working with these six other individuals and um, learning what their sounds are like and what their multiphonic fingerings for the saxophone are, or like what um, are the best violin licks or um, whatever. And, and really wrote a piece that um, it's hard to imagine being performed by someone else because it's seven people each with their own idiosyncrasies where I'm really emphasizing the idiosyncrasies. Um, But it kind of seems like, you know, whatever is going to help you write the best music that is most you and that is most personal is what you should be doing. And um, someday maybe someone will perform it, but um, especially if you're a performer yourself, you know, then you kind of have a hand in that and you can kind of get it out there, experience it. But um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just part of music being a living, breathing thing that, that doesn't just live on the page. And that's sort of what we, what we have to work with. I think the idea of using a video, some people might, there are some people who I would say, the only way to explain why they might, for instance, be opposed to having an explanatory video is that it's against their religion. Like, they can't tell you exactly why they don't Uh want you to do that. They just think it's wrong. You should write down these instructions on paper. But, you know, writing down instructions on paper was music at that time, embracing the newest technology. Hey, look, we've Uh got paper and we can write on it. Let's figure out a way to to notate this music instead of passing it, you know, along. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. And, it's like you know, learning a cover song. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of, you know. I mean, and, I, and like, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, oh yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I always get to speak first. Uh, uh, I was a singer-songwriter, actually, for a long time in, in college, and I did a lot of cover songs. And, you know, it's, it's in, you know, you're, I was piano vocal bass, and you want to cover an Elliott Smith song, and you have to come up with something that's not really going to sound like the guitar. But, yeah, I mean, it's about, um, you know, as a performer in that case, just using your ear creatively and trying to figure out what you want. And then maybe sometimes you do want to take it in a different direction. Um, I had a, a, a duo perform the flute piece, in full clown makeup doing this like crazy choreography. I was like, all right, that's awesome. You know, but totally different from the way I usually uh, present it. But, um, you know, You're game. yeah, I'm game, you know, I'm game for anything. <laughs> I think, uh, all you want is for people to be passionate about your music and to, to want to, to want to perform it and want to live in it. Absolutely. Um, so I don't want to let this skip by uh, Wet Ink Ensemble. You mentioned we should give an official, uh, you know, bio of Wet Ink and tell us how that came to be and what you guys are up to as an ensemble. Um, sure. Well, Wet Ink, um, we've been around, uh, I think we're in our like 15th season or so, but um, I've, uh, it, it was, um, I think that, uh, let's see, um, how to describe it. Well, at this point, we sort of have a, core ensemble of seven people, um, a couple of which are founding members. And then we have a lot of um, amazing people in the kind of larger group for uh, concerts with large ensemble works. Um, And the seven member group is what I was just referring to when I talked about my recent CD. And uh, we kind of formed that in order to facilitate touring and to have some kind of um, standard group of people that we knew would always be available to do concerts or, or travel. Uh, and just by virtue of who was game at that point, who was in the group, who, uh, felt really solid about all the wedding, wedding activities. Um, it ended up being kind of a, a strange instrumentation. So it's voice, flute, saxophone, percussion, violin, piano, and electronics. 
Yes. And sometimes accordion and other things. Um, but we just sort of ran with that and, and did a bunch of commissioning and got a lot of great works for the group. And um, yeah, things have been going really well lately. We kind of managed to really solidify our kind of joint values and um, just the uh, what we all get out of performing with each other at a moment right before everyone sort of started splintering off and getting jobs and moving away. So now it's not so difficult for us to come together again. So we had a gig in May that was for the large ensemble uh, in New York. And then I think that the, actually last week I couldn't go because of the Met thing, but um, most of the group went to play at the Walden camp, uh, which is a camp for new music composers in the middle school and high school age range. And in October, we're going to Germany to play at an electronic music festival, and I don't have, remember our season map quite, but yeah, we're we'll have, we're we'll on have links to that stuff in the show notes. Great, yeah, and it's on her site as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, a link to that. Yeah. So anyway, I, I to be honest, until recently, I didn't know. I, I'll see, like, I think I've even subscribed to the wedding Twitter Twitter feed or something. You didn't put those I, together. Yeah, and I never put those together, but I always think, oh, man, that is such a crazy group of instruments. I would love to write a piece yeah. for those guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of becoming uh, a model that you see a lot more where people who are into new music and come out of school band together to do something until they all get, you know, other jobs and start getting yeah. away and having babies or whatever. Right, right, right. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a... But then sometimes that becomes the thing. Yeah. I'm going to open my window. Um, yeah, I mean, I think luckily for us, um, you know, we, we sort of so insinuated ourselves into this group and, uh, I feel certainly that my work has really kind of come out of this experience that I, uh, consider it to be a really fruitful, creative aspect of my life still and, and something that I, that I want to prioritize. So now, even though there are babies and jobs and et cetera, um, it's, it's still something that we that it's so absolutely worth it to make time for and to really um, keep active with. And I think, you know, we've commissioned a lot of interesting pieces and we really kind of look for uh, interesting things to do with the large ensemble too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just nice to be a part of something, especially as you do leave school and kind of um, uh, aren't in that kind of nest of community that uh, younger composers tend to find themselves in. Right. Um. So an upcoming work that we uh, will come across in September uh, mm -hmm. will be Here Be Sirens. Um, and there'll be uh, four performances of this, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, there may be a couple more depending on early ticket sales, but definitely four. Yes. Oh, great. Great. Um, can you tell you us a little tickets. bit about... Yeah, yes. buy your tickets now. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about this um, piece and what we can look forward to? Sure. Well, actually, this piece was premiered in January. Um at Dixon Place Theater. So it's the same cast, the same uh, uh, designer, same directors, everything. And this is this was sort of a new, another kind of new um, step for me because it's uh, another kind of opera theater work, but I also wrote all the words. And um, some I, some of the uh, sung text is, is not mine, it's poems that I was um, using or, or other uh, works. It's about sirens so there's some greek and there's some latin but um it did turn into a kind of play opera hybrid and uh i had to really kind of test myself as a writer and as kind of an actor just sort of not when you're not up there singing and you have to kind of convince the audience of something so um i think it came about uh again sort of a few years ago i just sort of felt like i wanted to I had just sort of recently written the flute and voice piece and I had um, this kind of stage bug and I, and I just felt the relief of just sort of directly confronting the audience, which is something that I think I, I try to do in my chamber music too. And that uh, a life of a composer is one where you're, you're always sort of sitting back and you're kind of hearing your music through this distance and you're, you really don't know what, um, if it's reaching anyone, but when you're on stage and you're just sort of, um, directly addressing people and kind of insisting that they attend to you, then, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a sort of strange, uh, fascinating part of the art world and something that I've always loved as, a, as an audience for theater too. So I knew I wanted to do something with theater and um, I wanted to sing more and 
Oh no. Oh no. We lost Kate. Uh, uh, and she's not going to notice, and she's going to deliver the best, most help. I- engaged new music monologue in the history of monologue. I know. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I just finished totally the most point. engaged history uh, yeah. monologue in history of monologues. It's, I don't <laughs> think I can recreate it. It's, it's over. It's, it's, it was it's, we had the moment. It was yeah. done. It was over, yeah. it was over there. Yeah. It was just in the I'm, little I'm box over there. Yeah. It happened yeah. inside this screen. <laughs> too, exhausted to move, too exhausted to move on. Right. Well, I was probably rambling, and like the universe was like, "Let's shut this down." Um, <laughs> so this is being put on by uh, Morningside Opera. Yes, um, Morningside Opera. Mm-hmm. They seem like they're they at least their website claims that they're very inventive and have a scholarly bent. Which they do educational programs and stuff. Have you worked with them in any capacity other than just putting on this opera? Um, well, I know uh, several of them from Columbia, uh, where I went to grad school, and I think all of the founding members of Morningside Opera went to grad school. So um, I think we all kind of shared similar kind of scholarly interests in um, uh, gender studies and thinking about things like, um, I don't know, costume androgyny or um, just c- contemporary staging of, of older works. So I knew there were similar um, interests and values. And then one of the uh, co-directors, Amber Ewell, who was, supposed to be in the production, but then by the time we got around to staging, it was um, not in, in the country anymore. She and I were kind of brainstorming one night at a bar, and, and I was sort of talking about what I wanted to do and how I want to kind of move away from just writing concert music. And um, I think she sort of proposed, like, well, I need to do something with Morningside. So, yeah, it was just sort of um, my neck of the woods in New York at that point drew me together with them. But it was really wonderful to have uh, producer behind me, just have someone, Annie Holt, who's the, um, uh, one of the directors there, just keeping track of the schedule and kind of, you know, dealing with finding a stage manager and, um, you know, putting on an opera, which is a lot of work and a lot of pieces. And especially when you're working with a whole handful of designers, everyone needs to have their own vision and then it needs to work together to produce something coherent and moving and interesting and funny or whatever. Um, so yeah, they were, they were really great to work with. You know, you, you mentioned in, in right before you, we got cut off there, you talked about confronting the audience. Um, mm-hmm. and that strikes me as something that comes across really clearly in the video that we watched earlier. The, the eye contact is, is a really important part of the, the video part of it where you're, you're looking right at the other performer or you're looking right into the camera and you also mentioned your your background as is kind of a, a singer songwriter and that strikes me as, as another uh kind of direct confrontation with the audience i wonder how that plays out in a larger work like this where there there are more people and in, in, in presumably a larger audience than a camera uh-huh. yeah well it's definitely different and i think it is different also because of the um just sort of spoken aspect of it, the kind of play side of the opera. Um, and kind of like when I did the flute piece on a sort of maybe even more direct way, I was really kind of writing a character for myself who is sort of a mouthpiece for me. So the character that I play, Polixo, is a scholar and she's trying to figure out how to get off of the island as a siren. And does she have to keep staying here and like watching the ships go by and singing and then they crash and then another ship comes by and it's just really boring. And um, she's also wondering kind of like I do, what makes singing so powerful and why do we always uh, necessarily and helplessly kind of gravitate towards uh, the singer and what power does she have and does she have any ability to relinquish that? So um, thinking about all those things, I wrote a character who does really literally kind of confront the audience, like, um, you know, talking to them and I kind of have these shticks and, um, that was, you know, in a way it reminded me a little bit more of like teaching or something, which I, which I do now, um, at Smith college and which I did it as a grad student at Columbia a lot, because you really are talking to people. You're trying to convince them of something. And, and you're performing too. <laughs> yeah. And you're performing. Yeah. And you are performing as a teacher too. You know, the difference here was that I had like a crazy wig on and like big hobbit feet and I'm you like, don't teach in that. Uh, I don't, I thought about it, you know, it's like kind of my armor, but, uh, maybe when I get a little further along on the tenure track. That, but, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, that's, that's a, that's a post tenure plan. Yeah, I think, I think so. Then yeah. I will never take the wig off. Right. Um, 
but in a way it's also kind of a relief because you're just really saying what you mean which is something that we're always struggling to do in music and I still think it's a it's a worthy endeavor in music to say what you mean in this thing this medium that is not really a language but sometimes it can be nice to just actually say things right yeah so yeah I mean I, I loved it I, I love I, I can't wait to to start it up again um it's it was stressful I was you know very nervous at several instances but um but yeah there's there's nothing like it just sort of being in a world that you know in the in this world that you've created or someone else has created and um sort of trying to live in it and let yourself go a little bit. I experienced this with the um, piece on Friday at the Met a little bit too. And I want to get to that place in my chamber music too, if I can kind of find a way. Yeah. And, and it seems like you would have even more power to, to say what you mean it, it, when you're writing the text as you did for this. Yeah. And, yeah. And, that and, was and really with great good. power comes great responsibility. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm curious what that experience was like, how that was different for, for something like this compared to something where you're, you're working with, uh, either another person or an existing text? Well, I think um, at this point, I, I have I feel like I have so much that I'm trying to explore that I, I really appreciate. I, I want to work on my own writing more, and um, it's getting to a point where, and maybe at some point I'll just start writing string quartets again or something, but, um, but I, I really am thinking about text as I'm thinking about music, and uh, the music that I write, even if it doesn't involve me as a singer, which it often tends to these days, um, usually I'll be reading something or I'll be thinking about something and I'll be writing in a journal. So, um, so yeah. Oh, I forgot what the question was. I, I was just talking off. about the, the difference between writing your own stuff and, and working. Oh with yeah. Other stuff. Right. So for me now, like that tends to be the instigation and it tends to be the little seed pearl. Um, the writing that I'm doing or the writing that I'm compiling that someone else has done. So, um, it's, you, sorry, it's very rewarding for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Were you nervous when you first started doing that? I, I, I think in the, in the only times I've ever even thought about playing around with writing words, I, I feel really self-conscious about it because I spent all this time <laughs> working on writing notes and getting good at putting notes and sounds together. But I, I feel like, a total dilettante when I start to try to do the same thing with words. And yeah. Right. Well, I mean, she I is a writer. Yeah, yeah. sure. I clearly, you're much better at it than I well, ever I just have started been. saying that like after this opera came out, <laughs> right. I, my card now, which I, don't have. I mean, you, you said earlier you weren't even at first comfortable with calling yourself a soprano, well, right? A, you, mean, you even had, you gave us yeah. for those in the, in listening to the audio version of the show, we had air quotes around the word soprano um so well, yeah i mean and for me i i always sort of felt like a writer even before i felt like a musician and i i always thought maybe i would pursue that instead of music but then i i went to college and grad school and this all happened and i'm very grateful and it's fascinating but um but i i do feel at home writing and it's always been something that i've just kind of done um you know for better or worse um but yeah, it was very nerve wracking. And, and actually it's, I think, you know, when I was a singer songwriter, didn't, I wasn't self-conscious at all. Somehow it all just came out and again, for better or worse. But, um, when I started thinking that I wanted to write my own texts in concert music, I remember I had this whole scheme a few years ago. I've never even told anyone this. I think that where I was going to come up with the, I was going to invent a poet. I was going to have this like pseudonym, like huh. Batman care. And, and I think I even had a name for her. And I was like, I'll just say that like this person wrote the text and then, you know, kind of like, Hmm, how am I going to register this with BMI or, you know? And cause I was, I did feel very self-conscious. Like, again, I'm not a soprano. I didn't get a degree in this. I'm not a writer. I didn't, you know, study with anyone. Um, but I think, so, you know, you have to get over that every, you know, all of us collectively and just something is, calling to you and you don't feel trained you know i mean um, so if anyone wanted to interview the person who wrote the text they'd always be unavailable for comments. well no I, like would, I, would and I would put like my glasses and funny hat <laughs> oh okay hello yes i'm the poet and i didn't really think it all the way through, but, um, <laughs> because i did start writing my own text and, and the cd um voices from the killing jar with with wet ink there's a few pieces on there where i wrote the text and that was probably some of the first stuff where i started writing um concert music with my own text but sirens was very different because it was not just singing it was actual like 
monologue and like now I'm going to have a conversation with this other character but it, I loved it and actually I was very fortunate to be at the Radcliffe Institute while I was writing it and it was full of amazing writers and scholars and very you know successful playwrights and novelists and um, they very kindly um, some of my friends there let me have uh, a series of readings where we would just you know, sit in a room together and read it aloud and they would take on characters and, and they would give me some criticism and critique. So that was really, really helpful to kind of find my way into a community of writers, despite not really having earned it by, you know, um, going through yeah. a community of writers in school or anything like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, guess. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of interest in uh, transferring like things that I enjoy about sophisticated popular music into my composition. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that happens in that arena is singer-songwriter work is so different than being a air quotes here for people composer mm -hmm. because the words and the music have more of like created at the same time the interdependent upon each other quality, mm -hmm. which I really love. Um, and I think that your pieces do a fantastic job of pulling in that pop music vibe because it's dependent upon the personality uh, it, so much of it is dependent upon the personality of the singer. Mm -hmm. And as, at least in the way a lot of your pieces get performed, since you do them yourself, it really holds onto that vibe in a strong mm -hmm. way. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing and not a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it helped me get back to some of the things that I missed about being a singer-songwriter. I didn't miss the music I was writing, and I got sick of it. Um, but I did miss writing my own text and I missed the kind of personality aspect, which is not to sound like an egomaniac, but just that, that you actually get to express yourself, your real self somehow, um, which was something that was nice about songwriting. So yeah, I, I, I totally take that. And, and I think the whole music and words being written concurrently is also something that I, that, that feels right. And there've been concert pieces that I've written where I, searched for a poem because I needed a particular kind of vowel or, you know, um, I, it's, it's nice to feel like it can kind of go both ways and it's not just about setting a text per se. Right. Right. Different from just setting a text. That's what mm -hmm. I always say. Being a songwriter yeah. is not setting a text. No. Yeah. Um, and I think that it also, at, well, as an example, I played this, uh, uh, the flute piece, the one, what was it? Mm -hmm. The words. Only the words themselves mean what they yeah. say. It's a bit of a mouthful. So, when we first found that, like Dave showed it to us on the show, and we're like, "Oh my God, we got to get this woman on the show!" Uh -huh. the piece. And I played it for my music fundamentals class, which is like mm -hmm. pre-music theory. Okay, uh -huh. and uh, whereas if you play just about anything else, like I played the uh, Vario vocal sequenza, and they're uh -huh. like horrified, absolutely uh -huh. horrified, right. and and hate is not too strong a word. Wow. And then I played your piece. <laughs> That's and, <weird. laughs> I would say complete sort of like, oh, you know, but uh -huh. not the same because they feel like, I think that here's my personality, experience my personality aspect, mm -hmm. that kind of a performance is something uh -huh. that has an easy time, an easier time gripping, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a mode of understanding and experiencing music that they're very familiar with. Yeah, yeah, right. So really appreciate that. Well, I think oh, that good. curiosity really comes across, you, you, the curiosity about new sounds and, and putting things together in new ways. And you, you talked a lot in, in the discussion today about uh, experimenting and, and trying new things. And that the light about curiosity, I think, really comes across in that delivery that Sam was talking about that makes the performance so engaging. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. th thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I guess we're, I normally say this morning, but we're in okay. the evening as we're recording this. this. Right. But uh, th thank you so much. Uh, before we we wrap up uh, for for good this this interview portion, do you have anything that we haven't talked about that you wanna you wanna make sure to plug before we go? Um, I don't think so. I mean, come see here, be sirens. Where can people the worst find thing you? Is, uh, performing to an empty audience. Uh, people can find me at katesoper.com and people can check out wet ink at wetink.org. And uh, yeah, I have stuff on Vimeo and YouTube and there are links to that on my website. Um, uh, and she will have a piece performed at Tanglewood's Festival of Contemporary yes, Music. Right. This yes, right. I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm not going to be there, but I, I dearly love this piece. It's an older work that um, 
uh, is special to me with also a fascinating text by a Christian book. Um, and that will be July 20th in Ozawa at 8 p.m. So please go and tell me how it went. Hopefully I will be at a rehearsal or something. <laughs> well, it's a sign of success as a composer that p your pieces get performed in situations where you just can't be there. Because you got other well, important stuff. Yeah, I know. That's right. You wish you could be everywhere once. but Well, yeah. it's, I, it's only happened to me twice now, and it's terrifying. <laughs> Which, yeah, I don't know if it's. I guess so, yeah, I guess it's happened a couple times. Maybe it's maybe it's happening and we don't even know it. Yeah, <laughs> like all our movies are great now. Right. That's, I, I think that's safe to assume that that at any moment somebody in the world it's it's like it's five o'clock anywhere. Yeah. Right. Somebody's, somebody's performing Kate Soper's music somewhere in the yeah. world right right now as not only as I'm recording this oh, yeah. but as you listener or viewer are listening to or watching it. Uh, someone is performing. Kate, thank you so much for, for making some time this week. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been delightful talking to thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. It's been fun talking to you, too. Thanks again to Kate for joining us. Great conversation. Check out more of her stuff on her site, katesoper.com. And now we head to our usual news headlines. We had uh, some uh, an interesting story this week on New Music Box, kind of a, a behind-the-scenes tell-all type of thing from Alan McSweeney about uh, the Chicago Beethoven Festival and how the orchestra from last year's 2013 uh, mounting of the Beethoven Festival is it called the International Beethoven Festival or something like that. Um, um, but they were the orchestra was not paid right away. Apparently, the the festival was having some financial difficulties, and uh, they told the orchestra, "Hey, it doesn't look like we're gonna get to pay you." And the uh, there was a, a big to do about who was gonna get paid when, and some people were getting paid right away, and other people weren't. And it seemed that the people that were closer to the festival organizers, kind of personally, were the ones that were getting paid. And then, you know, over six months or maybe even longer later, some people got a portion of their pay, but still, most of the ensemble has not been paid in full to this day, right? To, to this day, right. Despite that, they are still putting together plans and hiring, we'll put that in air quotes, musicians to play in the 2014 Beethoven Festival. So this seems to me to be a, a, a pretty s s serious issue for the Chicago classical music community um, where this is taking place. Uh, and there's, there's a point... Uh, like I think we all kind of understand that the organizations that we work with don't have a lot of money. Like, we all understand that we're we're dealing in a world that is prime that is dominated by nonprofits that are always struggling, that are always having to work really hard to bring in new donors, new audiences, and find creative ways to meet their budgets and to, to, to get grants and all those other things. And I think we all understand that. But to, to keep telling people that you're going to pay them and then not paying them, at some point, you're no longer just like a struggling organization. At some point, you're just being an asshole to these, to these individuals. And I think that's the point that this has reached in Chicago. And Ellen even brings up this, this story at the beginning about a different gig um, about being offered a gig and then her asking how much it paid. And she was being offered this gig through a mentor of hers. And when she asked how much it, it paid, the mentor told her how much it paid and then said that that was in bad taste, that she shouldn't ask that kind of question. And I think, and, and as did seemingly everybody else that commented on the story, th that is just absolutely bonkers, right? If we're going to be professionals, there's, yeah, there's a point at which you do it for the experience and you do it for the exposure, whatever the hell that means. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my, my landlord will not allow me to pay my rent in exposure or my municipal utility bills in exposure. So I... I I, I don't know. This seems like a weird story. I do you guys have any thoughts on this? I think it's classy of Ellen to not name the mentor. <laughs> sure. That guy would be getting a lot of emails, or or girl, I should say. I um, mean, she, she called out the organization. Yeah. Um, 
but I can't think of any other circumstance in when, which, you know, I was being offered a gig to, and then you know, not ask how much money I was going to get, or, or, or I wouldn't be told. The conversation wouldn't be had at some point. Right. Um, that's just very awkward. It doesn't exist. That sort of thing doesn't exist with any other work that someone might do. Like, I wouldn't accept a job at any organization or at a company or anything without knowing what my salary was. Right, and that's that's the crazy thing. Like nobody, we we ex, we don't expect this kind of, uh, kind of shroud of mystery around getting compensated for a job in any other job, right? Would you would anybody else take a job where they didn't know how much they were going to get paid, but they would agree to do it? It seems really strange. And and another thing that's weird about this to me is that nobody has any contracts and nobody is in the union. Um, and I understand that those are tricky things, but like at some point you, we got to be, we, we have to start acting like professionals and not like college kids that are doing it for the beer money. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, so how, how does at this, we know what happened at the Beethoven festival last year. What can the Beethoven Festival this year? They if okay, let's accept that they want to continue going, and you know that's fine. They should if they can make it happen. How do they get their credibility well, back at this point? See, here, I would say they shouldn't do it if they can't afford to mount a festival, and they can't afford to mount a festival. That's it. We talked about the Hartford Wagner Festival last week, hiring uh, 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 somebody to make digital orchestra parts for their performances of the ring right if you can't afford an orchestra to do wagner then you just can't afford to do wagner and that's something you, it sucks but it's something you're going to have to live with and oh, if I'm you can't the... afford an orchestra for your beethoven festival then maybe you can't afford to put on a beethoven festival or I'm, maybe I'm you have to put on a beethoven they... festival of string quartets and piano sonatas i'm under the impression that they <laughs> or that at least they feel that they can do it again I mean, after everything, after all of the bad publicity that happened last year for this sort of thing, um, it, se it would seem kind of crazy if they said, hey, guys, we're going to have another festival, but um, we're in the same predicament as last year. I haven't heard them say they don't have the money again. Well, what about the people that played last year that still haven't been paid? Yeah, that's a good point. They should actually pay them first before they ever talk about putting on another festival. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think it's it's completely idiotic, and and, and I would... If the person were in front of me that were in charge of doing this, I would berate them to their face. I, it makes me really angry, as you can tell, that, that they would even consider putting on the festival again when they can't pay the people the first time. Mm. Like I, I, I understand, and I think even the musicians probably understood the night of the show when they said, sorry, it's, it's, we, we don't have the money. But to to still not have the money now the the next year... And the festival be planning the and, and the festival planning <laughs> the next iteration of of their thing like that's completely insane. It's completely insane. Sam, are you with us? Yes. Um, it doesn't it doesn't go just for performers. Actually, Kyle Gann has a comment on Ellen's blog post that's pretty funny. Uh, he says the Europeans are the worst about paying, as though smugly assured I wasn't going to cross the ocean to collect. <laughs> he says he once faxed a French record label every day uh, asking where his check was. Um, he did that for like nine months. And then it says Italy owes him $3,000 to this day for work done 20 years ago. He once took an editor at Harper's Bazaar a bottle of champagne to celebrate the first anniversary of the day he turned in his article. And he is still waiting to get paid. So maybe it's just music where people think that uh, you're willing to do it for nothing. Well, well I, I guess think, I think no, the it's Kyle Gann thing is a little different because they're assuming that he doesn't have the the wherewithal to to deal with the legal systems in their countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if if the the Italian company that, that owes him money would have stiffed him if he were an Italian. I feel like a, a lot of that is that he's an American. Yeah. And, it, and that's why I think why this sort of like thing can happen with vendors a lot, though, too, um, or like contract work in general. 
Um, you know, it, con- contractors who do work for companies are constantly following up about receiving their checks. Like that's a part of the job. Um, and you know, sometimes budgets don't work out for companies and things, and then you might have to wait. You might have to wait a few more months or something to get your check if you're doing graphic design or whatever it might be. Well, a few months, I think, is is something that people understand for contract work, but it, it's clear that they actually can't afford these musicians, and this has yeah. been going on for a really long time mm. now. Um, and I was I was reminded when I saw this of a great video by a designer, a great talk that a designer named Mike Montero gave uh, at at a design conference in. Uh, California a few years ago it's recorded and and you can you can see the video of it it's 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 called F U pay me only they don't abbreviate the first word uh and he actually says uh, so if you're if you're watching this and you're and you're sensitive to strong language maybe you shouldn't watch this other video that I'm recommending uh but it's called uh F U pay me and it's this designer and his attorney sitting down and talking about what happens when things like this happen um and the important thing is that there's always a contract and it, it, it surprises me that, that nobody thought to have a contract with these musicians. Well, can you hear me guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get the impression that the, the environment in the same way that you shouldn't ask, um, how much you're getting paid because, um, it's such a, you know, performer rich environment. And if you get a, a reputation as a troublemaker who actually wants to know what you're being paid, but they'll pass you over next time, it seems like it would fit in that context too, you know. You don't want to ask for a contract because that's what troublemakers do. It's just it's crazy to me. Well, if if they're gonna not work with you because you asked for a contract, then they're the kind of jerks that you may not want to work with. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the, at some point, there's got to be a commitment from both sides. And that's essentially what the union is for, right? If everybody is in the union, then everybody expects to have a contract and everybody expects that contract to have certain provisions in it. And that is powerful only in as much as everybody does it. So hopefully they can convince everybody to, to start doing it. And that's that's really our only big uh, discussion story this week because we talked to to Kate for such a long time um, and and really enjoyed it. So we uh, we're kind of zipping through everything else. Um, do you guys have any more thoughts on that before we move on? No. Uh, no. The, pay your composers. The the next pay thing, yeah. Pay your pay your musicians. Pay your composers. Uh, people who are doing work for you as professionals should be paid as as professionals and treated as professionals. Um, so WQXR, the, the great, uh, radio station in New York city has launched a new podcast hosted by Nadia Sirota. And, uh, it's something that we talked about when they were kickstarting it, uh, a while ago called meet the composer. Uh, the first episode's out. It's a really interesting show. If you guys listen to it. I haven't listened to part of it. it yet. It's it's an hour or so long, and it's it's just kind of a deep dive into the music uh, and 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 personality of John Luther Adams, uh, which is great because he just won the Pulitzer. Then they didn't they didn't know that when they were putting this together, but uh, it's a, it's a really interesting look at his background in music, how he got into to composition and the kind of things that he thinks about when he's writing. Um, so you should definitely check it out. We'll have a link to where you can do that in, in the show notes. And it's wonderful that the, uh, the online media conversation about new music is growing. So, um, we're, we're really, we're really happy to check this out and, and they're going to have, I don't know how often they're planning to release them. Um, but they're going to have a, a number of these with different composers, uh, on a regular basis. And you should, absolutely subscribe to this podcast because it's gonna be great uh, or it is great after just one episode i should say um the editing seems pretty cool too yeah they, they they've they've got a bunch of of clips from the music in there and uh it's all it's all very well thought out and they've got people talking about the composer in addition to the composer himself um so it's really interesting you get a get a feel for who uh john luther adams is and you know why he lives in a shack in 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 Alaska to write such awesome music? Um, it's I, a very composed and put together thing, and not a casual interview like we do. Right, 
Right. It's 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 definitely a different sort of thing than what we do, but a very good thing. Um, yeah. So definitely, once you've listened to this and subscribed to Sound Notion and all of our shows, the next show that you should subscribe to is Meet the Composer. Um, the the next thing <laughs> the I number want... two podcast right no, out there <laughs> right right no 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 there's no, there's no ranking they're they're great and and I like what we do too um, we talked to Drew McManus a while ago about a project that he had to digitize and make searchable on the internet um, these tax forms called 990s for orchestras and they have all kinds of information about compensation in them and they're they're in formats now that are public because they're they're the the the, the tax filings of these uh, nonprofit institutions and you can get certain information about them um, just by requesting them but they're all in different formats and they're all spread out in different places um, and what Drew's idea was was to make them all searchable and put them all in one place and digitize the information so that you could have computers understand what was going on there and therefore have computers do more thorough comparisons and more meaningful comparisons between the way different orchestras operate uh, financially. And his, his 990 project Kickstarter didn't get off the ground, unfortunately, but there has been uh, some, some new developments on that front uh, about a lawsuit uh, that is, I, it looks like they're suing the IRS or they're... An, orga- an organization called Public Resource, publicresource.org, is bringing a lawsuit against the IRS to compel them to start releasing 990 data um, in a text searchable format. So this is basically exactly what Drew wanted to have happen. And let's be clear that the 990 data is, quote, air quotes, and I don't even have video today, so I'm telling you I'm doing air quotes, um, uh, it's already available, but it's just in a PDF, non-searchable. So if you want to know anything, you have to read the entire thing. You can't search through it as if it's a data block. Um, that's the big thing because the information is technically available. Right. Um, they're suing to make it so it's available in a meaningful way that lets people actually search through it and find things. And in a day when Every time a labor dispute comes up with an orchestra, you know, there's a he said, he said, she said, we said, they said about how much money is going where and who's getting paid what and all this kind of stuff. This would give everyday Joe Schmoes on the street the ability to get those answers for themselves so we can have an honest talk about it instead of the he said, she said thing. Right, and that's always the problem. And when we yeah. when we have these labor disputes, is that one side says, "Well, you're not spending your money wisely," and the other side says, "Well, you're just being greedy jerks." So mm-hmm. the, this is maybe a way to to get a little bit more objective information about that. And and President Obama has has had uh, the this these open government initiatives trying to get going for basically as long as he's been president Obama. Um, and, uh, he, I, 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 I found, uh, and, and posted in a comment to this, this thing, uh, on Drew's blog, a quote from an executive order, um, that president Obama signed recently. It says openness in government strengthens our democracy, promotes the delivery of efficient and effective services to the public and contributes to economic growth as one vital benefit of open government, making information resources easy to find accessible and usable. That's the key. I think for this one Mm -hmm. and usable can fuel entrepreneurship, innovation and scientific discovery that improves Americans lives and contributes significantly to job creation. Uh, and so I think that, that that step about it being usable is what's really key here. Because as, as Sam said, it is available now, but it's not available in any format that we can do anything useful with. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing how this goes. Obviously, it's going to take a really long time uh, for anything to change. But we are we are nonetheless optimistic, as we are always optimists at Sound Notion. Right, Sam? Yes. Yeah. Especially Dave. Right. Um, the music world this week says goodbye to a couple of uh, people who've been around and influencing pop music for years and years. One you may not have heard of, uh, Jerry Goffin, that is with a G, Goffin, um, was the lyricist with Carol King. 
Uh, they were married at one point and then divorced, but they kept working together, had two kids together, and kept working together for years and years. And uh, while you may not know the name Jerry Goffin, uh, let's see. Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? Take Good Care of My Baby, Some Kind of Wonderful, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, um, Don't Ever Change, etc., The Locomotion, etc., etc., etc. He has been the lyricist on many, many, many songs that he and Carol King came up together and then sold to a huge variety of artists, including the Drifters and Elvis Presley and the Beatles and the Monkees, etc. He passed away this week, and Casey Kasem. Are you guys still hearing me? We got you. Okay, Casey Kasem, who was the long, long time host of what is it called, America's Top or the Billboard Top, Top 40, Forty or whatever. Yeah, and he passed away on last Sunday, and uh, not much to say. I mean, you could get into a, an analysis of what giving a national top 40 count did to the way music was perceived in the country. Well, it, the, it was the, just, I mean, it already existed. He was just making it, well, making yeah, it into it, a show. It, that started in 1970, and that's when the homogenization of music in this country started. And then MTV, 10 years later, put the nail in the coffin. Was it, were the rankings by Billboard? Billboard I, magazine. I don't, I don't know if Billboard was the one that were doing the, the top 40. Was it, is that where they were getting their, their, well, Bill, I don't know. their rankings? For Billboard magazine. Okay. I, I mean, that's what, it said in, that's what it said on the obit that I read this morning. Okay. I'm not. The obit is an obit sort of slash lightweight analysis of the effect of the top 40 and stuff like that. In the, well, and, and you can, there's all kinds of, I mean, you can, we could get into to, to that a lot and we could get into yes. the, the, the weird life that Casey Kasem led after he kind of left the public eye, uh, and and the the particularly weird last month or two of his his life that he yeah. was in the news a lot, but he certainly had a pretty profound impact on American musical culture uh, yeah. for a big part of the 20th century. So yeah. uh, it's, I think it's important that we acknowledge him here. Uh, and that's going to do it for this week's episode of Sound Notion. Do you guys have anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Um, did we mention Bobby Womack? Uh, we, I don't think we were going to. Oh, okay. All right. Well, no problem. <laughs> Bobby Womack's, uh, quote, legend of the soul era also passed away this week. So, uh, uh that's going to do it for this week's episode of Sound Notion. Uh, thank you to everyone for watching or listening. And thank you to Kate Soper for joining us again. Um, sorry for the, the weird cutting in and out. We had to, to rearrange things for, for her schedule this week. And that that's fine. Um, if you would like to interact with us on the social media, if you want to comment or find links about anything that we talked about this week, uh, you can go to our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, and you can get links to all the stories that we talked about, all of our social media things. Um, you can comment on the on the site there. You can watch live when we do this show on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Though I will say that we're not going to be around next Sunday. We're taking the week off for American Independence Day. We'll be back the week after that on the 13th of July. So we'll be back on July 13th, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, live.soundnotion.tv. You can connect with us on Facebook, on Twitter, we're at Sound Notion. Um, on YouTube, you can subscribe to us and comment on the YouTube posts of these videos. Uh, you can also check out our Tumblr blog at blog.soundnotion.tv. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store. Uh, and so you'll get every episode downloaded automatically to your favorite device. And you can leave us a review in, in the iTunes store or wherever you, you get your podcasts from. That would be very helpful to us. If you'd like to support the show, uh, you can do that. Leave those comments. Tell your friends. Use our Amazon affiliate uh, search on, on our site. Uh, and that always helps us out a lot. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. <laughs>